So I'd like to welcome onto the stage uh, a bunch of people from Polymer engineering team uh, to answer all your questions. So first, Justin Fagnani is an engineer on the Polymer tools team. Monica is an engineer who you've met many times today and yesterday on the Polymer team. Uh, Rob Dodson, developer, advocate, extraordinaire, expert in all things web and general internet celebrity. Uh, Wendy Ginsberg, the product manager on the Polymer team itself, who gave the keynote yesterday. And Steve Orvel, the mastermind, one of the masterminds behind the Polymer Core library and engineer on the Polymer Core team as well. All right, so we have two microphones, uh, one microphone up here, two microphones up here. Uh, so please come up, ask your questions. This is an open space, this is a safe space. We love being here with you. There are no such thing as dumb questions. Uh, please come up, ask us anything. Uh, you can also tweet at us at the hashtag AskPolymer, and we're looking through those tweets live, and so I'll be, I'll be looking through a machine up here to try to get some of those questions delivered to our panel as well. All right, great. So to kick us off, I have a question in the barrel, which is that lots of exciting stuff coming out uh, yesterday and today with Polymer and NPM and ES6 modules, uh, lots of excitement about how to develop components. Also a little hesitancy for a lot of folks who really enjoyed being able to author HTML in HTML. Uh, so is there anything that you're thinking about in terms of how we can kind of better support that use case that has been so special to so many Polymer developers uh, of authoring HTML in, in HTML? Please. Um, yeah, so I mean, I first want to say that uh, we hear you. Uh, we spent a lot of time yesterday and today talking to people who were, you know, kind of lamenting the loss of uh, authoring in HTML. And it kind of makes sense because that's something that's been a little bit unique about Polymer. And you people have chosen to use Polymer, and that's why you're here, because you like it a lot. Um, and so it's definitely got us thinking about ways we can you know, help support that kind of style and that kind of workflow, uh, even as we move to JavaScript modules. Um, it's important to note, though, that also our philosophy of using the platform kind of means that like, when the platform gives us a tool and in this case kind of denies us another one that we were hoping to use, um, the, we, our choice is in a sense made for us a little bit. We have to go to JavaScript modules because that's the native loading solution on the web. Um, but we can look at ways to kind of layer the project and provide ways to you know, uh, have some tooling or something like that. The, the, the important thing is that Polymer 3.0 is very, very early in preview stage. And so there's a lot of time for feedback and a lot of time for uh, experimentation with solutions to give you the, um, you know, the ability to write HTML and HTML. So and the actual Polymer part is the same. Yeah, I mean, the actual string that you write is the same template. In fact, you could draw a line from every line in a, uh, a HTML import to a line in a uh, JavaScript file, and there would be a one-to-one -one correspondence between every line in there. We're just um, following Semver, and that's why you have to bump the major version. Yeah. Um, so we hear you. Uh, we have some interesting ideas on how we can uh, you know, serve the best of both worlds. You know. Yeah, and I'd just add quickly that, you know, again, based on feedback, um, the reality is exclusive modules are here today and we want to support them. Um, you know, but there's some spec work potentially to develop an HTML extension to those modules. And that's something that we'll be thinking about and you know, evaluating and seeing kind of you know, if our users are really clamoring for HTML. Um, on our own team, I will say that there was definitely a bit of like, difficulty ripping that Band-Aid off. Um, but we're also excited about some of the new things that modules are going to provide. I mean, lit is an excellent, um, interesting direction, and um, you can't do that in HTML. So, um, you know, we're going to be experimenting and listening for feedback. So a closely related question um, that should hopefully be quick. If I'm working on a new project right now, should I target 2.0 or 3.0? 2.0, yeah. definitely. Um, 3.0 is very, very early. Uh, and the other thing to note is that the, we, when we published core and all the elements, those were literally converted automatically by a tool minutes before we published them up. It was like one process. So if you're on 2.0 and you keep pushing forward and you do that, we're going to take you to 3.0 automatically. So. Fun fact, you can tell that they were published while we were here because we uh, got rate limited by GitHub on the conference uh, IP. 
Wi-Fi, so that if anybody was trying to use the GitHub API, you couldn't do it, because Justin did all of it. No, we used the GitHub token. That wasn't us. Uh, there was just so many people in the code lab. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, you know, a little bit of straight talk to steal Gray's uh, term is you know, we're really aiming, as Justin said to, uh, earlier, to um, you know, not change the API between 2.0 and 3.0 just as little as we have to, absolutely have to, you know. And uh, actually, Kevin's app that he built, he transferred the whole thing using the, you know, the tool that Justin's team has built. Um, and, you know, it had some bugs for a while, but, uh, you know, the latest version worked pretty seamlessly. And the kinds of, I mean, you know, I think Justin sort of obtusely mentioned we're changing as little as we can, or maybe it was Fred, we're changing as little as we can. Honestly, like, let me give you just one example. There's the Polymer import href. What did that do? It created an HTML import. Well, there's no more HTML import, so you have to do that differently, right? This is like that's about the, what we're going to change. That's the only change, really. Yeah. And in so, fact, this, this brings up a good point. Um, you know, if you're vending open source elements out there, we actually recommend that when you use the converter, you do not change the API of your elements at all. Treat them as having the same major version, even if you bump the major version because it's now modules, because that, when, that means when your users run the converter, they will automatically be compatible with your element. So we look at this transition as is, is not really an API breaking change. It's just a repackaging. All right, let's go to a live question. And I have a question regarding tooling and improving uh, developer experience. Uh, is there any opportunity you, uh, uh, you, you are uh, developing in, to have provided hot module replacement? Like you, you are coding and you immediately see the changes in browser. Oh, hot module reloading. Yeah. That's a tools question, Justin. Yeah, yeah I mean. <laughs> 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 we, we don't have any work planned on that. Um, there are several ideas on how you can do that. Uh, th one of the things with hot module reloading is you often get into a problem where uh, if you're replacing some JavaScript, it's hard to, huh? <laughs> it's hard to replace the state that might have gotten in a certain you know, state through some path of, of code that you took. Um, so I was just talking with some people today about ways we could make templates auto reload. Um, in, uh, Kevin's been looking at using Redux, which um, you know, has some facilities for that kind of stuff that can replay your state. Um, we don't have any immediate plans, but it's an interesting and open question. Yeah, I, mean, I will say that um, Kevin kind of alluded to in his talk that we're considering ways, you know, we're not really prepared to say exactly what we're ready to build right now, but we'd like to improve the overall developer sort of end to end experience. And um, you know, Kevin demonstrated using Redux as a, as a good way to do that. And a, a tool like that works well with something like hot module reloading. And you know, this is something that I think we can explore without can really committing to anything. I mean, you know, frankly, I think we'd love to be able to build something that community can uh, also contribute to. And, and you know, if that's a useful feature, that's great. Thanks. All right. So we have another question about tools, which is, uh, what are the plans for all the various tools that Polymer Tools team builds uh, when it comes to Polymer 3? So with Polymer CLI, what's going to happen with Polymer Bundler? Will it be replaced by Webpack plugin, et cetera? Yeah, so there's a, a little bit to be figured out there, but uh, I'm kind of on the mind that we have two different paths to explore here, uh, probably at the same time. One is we have existing customers who are using the CLI and who are successful and happy, and we want to keep them moving forward into this world without them having to ditch our tool chain. So we have been adding support for NPM. We now have an NPM flag on the CLI and PolyServe and WCT. Uh, and we'll probably try to add support for modules uh, as an incremental choice that you can add into your project as you go. Um, but we also want to enable people to like, not have to use our tools uh, because we're so different from everyone else. To be able to use Rollup and Webpack uh, and all these other options that everybody else has out there. So we're, we're definitely going to take care of you and keep our tools moving forward. Um, it could be we'll look at opportunities to replace some of our custom stuff with something that the community already has, so we have to do less work. Um, but we're also going to explore the idea of, you know, if you have an existing project and you want to sprinkle Polymer in, you can do that without having to buy into our tool chain. Make Rob happy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> With uh, Polymer 3 and the transition to NPM, what was the kind of reasoning for choosing to go with Yarn and a flat dependency tree as opposed to using NPM and peer dependencies? Um, 
<laughs> getting all the questions here. Uh, uh, happy to do it, though. Um, it's really the platform again. Uh, a lot of people uh, kind of think they've been using JavaScript modules uh, because there's been support in all the compilers uh, that will, will turn ES6 syntax into uh, common JS or something. But it turns out that the web-compatible modules are a little more restrictive than what people have been using, say, in the Node or like Webpack ecosystems. And they require that you import by path, just like HTML imports. And so HTML imports and Bower worked well together because Bower installed flat, and then you can import Polymer by importing uh, dot dot slash Polymer, right? So we have that same situation on NPM. Uh, JavaScript modules require importing by paths. If you want to import from another package, you do import dot dot slash and that package name. Uh, and that kind of forces us to have packages in a flat layout. Uh, and Yarn does that. NPM currently doesn't. I hope they consider adding that feature, and then we'll be able to use uh, the NPM client as well. Yeah, I think there's, there's really two reasons. Number one is you know, custom elements have a, you know, when you define a custom element, nope, that's used. You can't use it again. So that doesn't really work well. If you have to be careful about that. So loading a dependency twice is bad for that. The other reason is loading dependency twice is horrible for, perform for performance. So, you know, relying on a tool to make your page completely not suck and load the same code over and over and over again is not ideal, I think. Um, when we install flat, we ensure we don't do that. Thank you. I do think, actually, it is worth pointing this out a little bit. So, um, it's also important to understand that your client side dependencies. You definitely want those to be flattened. As Steve was saying, you don't want to ship 10 versions of the same thing to the client. That sucks, right? Your dev dependencies, all your build tools and things like that, those can actually still have like the nested node install. And so there may be a little like fine tuning that we need to do here to make sure that like it's very easy and ergonomic for developers to sort of like be like, okay, cool, I, I flatten my client side stuff and I. One of the things you tried out was different. Yeah. Folders for different. Folder. Yeah. yeah. So like these are my client side dependencies. These are my like normal node or build or whatever dependencies. Yeah. Flat on one, don't flat on the other. And, yeah. and we still have a lot of work to give everyone templates that they can start from that are set up to to serve and build in the proper way. So we'll we'll be coming out with that in the coming weeks. Yeah, but like just personally, like I even though there is a little bit of work and overhead involved sometimes in flattening your client side dependencies. The flip side of that is, you know, I think with Webpack you have um, the, what is it, the common chunks plugin or something like that. So it's like, I mean, you're, you can either dedupe this at install time and handle it yourself that way, and at least then you've got like a GUI kind of walking you through it. Or you've got to like put this whole thing into your build process to dedupe your packages. So you're doing it one way or the other usually. And personally, it seems like doing it as early as possible in the install process is, is a good thing. Let's jump to a question from Twitter, uh, which is, what about accessibility? So how does Polymer work with voiceover and screen readers in general? Yeah. Rob <laughs> uh, OK, hi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how does Polymer work with accessibility? I mean, generally, like, fine. I can't think of anything that is, like, you know, painfully broken. The biggest issue is going to be around Shadow DOM. So most of the stuff that we do in accessibility to build relationships, so you say, for instance, um, you have attributes like are you labeled by and things like that, where you, you actually say, this element is labeled by that other element, and you use an ID reference to that other element. So literally like CSS ID reference, right? Um, the challenge there is with Shadow DOM, right, you're creating this little scoping bubble. Your IDs are scoped to that bubble. And so you can easily end up in situations where you've got something in the Shadow DOM that you would really like to label or you'd really like to refer to with like ARIA controls or something like that, and you're unable to do it. You just like can't get down there. Um, so there are a few things that we're working on to fix this that aren't actually like Polymer specific. Um, but are just like web platform stuff. So probably the most important is the new accessibility object model, which uh, you can find that on github.com slash WICG slash AOM. Um, and this is basically like adding a programmatic API to accessibility and making it a lot easier for you to imperatively like, so, you know, like set up relationships in JavaScript between elements and say, like, hey, I've got this element here, and I have access to its accessible node property. And I can actually then give it a, an actual like, node reference in JavaScript. So then I could you know, 
hop through shadow boundaries and things like that. Um, that's probably the most important thing that I think we're doing to fix this, and that, that'll, that'll help web components, obviously, but it'll also just make accessibility more broadly across the platform easier for, for developers, I think. Let's go to a live question. Oh. Um, so one of the reasons when I started using Polymer was uh, because I could just serve up data on a flat um, with just Nginx or a static server. But most of the examples I've seen now or over the past year have always been through a dynamic node server or something like that. So I just want to make sure that, you know, one of the, uh, that that's going to stay in Polymer that you can just serve from a static server. All of the things that I build are always from a static server. That's like a, okay. a, a moniker rule. So um, they always work. The only time I do extra things is to bundle. But there's no requirement. It's just imports. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why modules require paths, is because yeah. the browser needs to figure out the exact URL to load. And then uh, with yarn flat, it'll be able to find it and load it. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I would add is um, because of the way that Custom Elements version one is defined, because of the current existing browser support, and because of our desire always to ship really optimized <coughs> sets of code to the browser. We do sometimes what's called differential serving to serve just the right bundle. You know, like for IE 11, we can't serve ES6. This is why we will sort of provide tools to let you serve the optimized thing. Um, hopefully, that's going to go away soon <laughs> uh, in the next year or two. Go to that question. Hey, uh, I'm really happy with uh, all the tooling and documentation you guys have provided to. Uh, help move users from Polymer 1, then to Polymer 2, and now to Polymer 3. It's like, you know, really made it as turnkey as possible for folks like myself. Um, but my question is, you know, there's still obviously a lot of projects and code out there with Polymer 1 still, um, and using the 0.x web components polyfill. What do you guys have in terms of a long term support strategy or end of life plan for Polymer 1 and, you know, obviously eventually? Polymer 2 and those uh, 0.x polyfills as well. Oh, actually, really quick, can you repeat the question for anyone watching on like video or live stream? Oh, sorry. Sure. I mean, Taylor. Yes, so the question was around uh, end of life support and just general kind of long term support for Polymer 1 and polyfills. Yeah, I mean, um, so basically, there's the native features that we rely on is one part of the question. And you know, this is sort of web standard practice, right? Those will not be removed for centuries probably until like the we actually do crazy stuff like, you know, how many people use these things? Um, but so those won't go away really. And you know, Polymer, we're supporting hybrid mode, so um, I think I can't say exactly, but we intend essentially to kind of adopt a similar policy where as long as there's need, we'll continue to support it. And unless Taylor tells me differently. <laughs> does, does that also include the V0 Shadow DOM implementation in Chrome? That's a good question. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, this okay. is really what I'm speaking to. I mean, the, the policy, basically, one of the reasons the web is great is because it really doesn't break. And, uh, you know, Chrome kind of leapt ahead of everybody with V0 Shadow Root, and, um, you know, this is going to be available as long as people are using it. Cool. Um, Thank you. The, the way uh, features are removed from Chrome is that we keep tracking them. We have a percentage of pages that are using it. And you can see that as well. Sorry. That's yeah. Public information. Um, Chrome status. Uh, Chromestatus.com, Chrome yeah. Um, and they have to drop below like a, a very small threshold, it's like 0.03%. Like yeah, 0.03% like of yeah. all pages are using this feature. And if it drops below that, then you're confident enough that it's basically just like old pages or unused pages or just, we're sorry, we're going to break you. Okay. Um, so I don't think we're nearly close enough and we're not, there's no chance we're going to go there in the next year. So. One thing that is happening soon that's going to make Monica excited, yeah. but <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, if, if anybody was here still on like 0.5 or anything and you're using the deep selector in CSS. Or the shadow selector. Um, yeah, or that too. Uh, those are going away very soon in Chrome and that will change the styling of your page. So uh, we've been trying to urge people to get up to Polymer 1.0 and stop using that for the last couple of years. Uh, hopefully you have. They're basically <laughs> getting replaced by the descendant selector. So like it's not going to make your style not get applied, but Deep is just like, it becomes a descendant selector. So it's not going to go into shadow roots or anything like that. Yeah. There's been a little, little warning in the console for quite a while. It's like a year. But it's very easy. It's weird. I have yeah. this like 
innate reaction now. I see the warnings and I'm just like, clear. <laughs> so like, do that. If, break you were, if you were like me. Um, <laughs> so you're still triggering the warnings? Uh, no, no, Rob. no, man. Um, <laughs> but like, if you're like me, like you, you gotta fix your stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> definitely going to break. It's definitely getting removed. Yeah. Luckily, I've seen some sites that I, hopefully they've moved. Uh, it doesn't break them that bad. The little tweaks. All right, let's jump to another Twitter one. Uh, how optimistic are you, and what are your feelings about other browsers agreeing to native element extension? And what can we as the developer community oh, do so to this is like, help? Are we I assume do, this is, 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 equals. is equals. Is equals, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I will take this one. It's my cross to bear. Um, is equals is a great idea where the, the idea of extending a custom element or the idea of adding your own set of functions and behaviors and prototypes to a native element, this idea, I'm very clear here, um, is agreed on by all browsers. The implementation of this idea is not agreed on by all browsers. So the current is equals implementation in particular is not, is very content, like, contentious and is not agreed on by all browsers. Um, and this means that we would like to, we will continue fighting for something like is equals. It will probably not be is equals in the state that it is. Hilariously enough, as equals is a likely contender one letter off. Um, but basically, there is a need for extending custom elements. There are things that you cannot do unless you are in a development. Um, for example, submit forms. So in parallel for, with us fighting for this API to actually work, we're also fighting for browsers to actually you know, just fix the form element. Form elements should look at custom elements. There's no reason why the form developed 20 years ago should not look at something developed now. So it's a hard question. We're working on it. We're trying very hard to write specs. It's, a, it's an ongoing battle. Yeah, I think one of the things to uh I'm not, I, I don't know if this is entirely accurate, but I'm going to say it on stage as if it is. Um, <laughs> if you add a shadow root to an element that you've type extended, like, so let's, one of, the, one of the things is like, oh, select, right? Select is amazing, and it has all this built-in accessibility and, and presentation to it. And my understanding is if I extend that and then add my own shadow root, like, all of that <laughs> goes away. It and so work. it's... It doesn't even work. It, it, it doesn't just, let like, you do it. Yeah, OK. It just dies. So, like, yeah, so there's, like, a lot of things that you might, like, think that you want to do with is equals that actually just aren't going to quite work. And so then it, it does become a bit of like a, a weird API where yeah. it's like you get some stuff, but not all the stuff. Um, and the browser's not very good at like pinky swearing. Like I pinky swear I'm not going to do bad things because I've yeah. read there's like these 20 things that I can add a shadow root to, but not these other four or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So I, I definitely think, uh, personally, yeah, I, I want just them to sort of like expose the primitives or fix the elements. I want like the label element and the form element and all these things to just either just work with custom elements or let me sort of imbue my custom element with formness and labelness and labelability and things like that. And one day, one day this will happen. I yeah, promise. I just add, personally, I'm not, personally, I'm not very optimistic, just speaking for myself only. Um, again, because I think this concern, for example, that Rob brought up around shadow roots is a really good idea of the larger problem. You know, in V0 custom elements, you could extend input but you couldn't add a shadow root to it. So what you could actually do to it was kind of limited. Why? Because it had this native legacy implementation. And this is really the larger concern, is that these native elements have this long history of you know, C++ implementation and crazy specs before custom elements was even a thing. So the long-term fix is to expose those APIs and make those available to any custom element that wants them. And maybe there's a shorter-term fix. It probably isn't going to be is. It may be some crazy thing. Um, and, you know, we know that people really want this, and so we're definitely kind of got our fingers on the pulse of that, and, uh, and we'll be pushing for something. Because I think, you know, the exposing the guts of input so that you could do it all yourself is probably a 25-year project. Um, yes, yeah, so, you know, we probably need something in the meantime, and if is is objectionable, um, you know, we'll be pushing and sort of pushing people for some better solution. And I'll give a little shout out to Mariko's talk earlier today. All of these discussions oh, are not yeah. in some secret back room. These are all happening out in the open on public mailing lists. So oh, if you have good use cases, yeah. and on GitHub, yeah, on GitHub. So uh, if you're really passionate about it, please go and like, tell everybody you're very upset that is equals is not a thing. Uh, I was going to say specifically W3C, or github.com W3C slash web components. Yeah. There you go. Go 
voice your complaints. Yeah. It's the only way we get things done by proving that you actually want something like is equals. Yeah. They don't believe me. All right, <laughs> let's go to a live question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so my question was, in fact, related to the previous one. But first, I'd like to thank you for letting us use the bleeding edge of this bag right now before it was, you know, recommended. Uh, and given the the is attribute is, is gone, what's the the migration path that you would propose to the currently implemented uh, elements that are using is attribute, especially those that are using specific parsing context like template, script, table, TR, and stuff like that. Wait, do you want to repeat the question? I think we're getting it from the pickup. Oh, okay, great. Oh, okay. Um, so thing that I did with form, for example, so Iron Form was an extension of form. Um, you convert it into a wrapper, and then you put content in it. So basically, all of the, the extra is equals things that you were doing, you put on a wrapper element. But that, for TR, is kind of yeah, tables are tricky. Tables are tricky. But remember that you can Don't style. Use yeah, you can style things as tables with CSS, so you could move to yeah, a, but a different. You, you can't style thing like a template tag. Oh, it, what? Sorry. No. Template tag. No. Yeah, you yeah. cannot. So. Yeah, I mean, what what Polymer did. I mean, yeah, it's not super pretty. We're not gonna lie. Um, but this sort of decoration pattern is essentially this is what Polymer did with like we used to in Polymer 1.0 we had template is DOM repeat we. For sort of compatibility, we did some magic where we sort of made that work in Polymer templates in 2.0. But the way that we actually make that work is we have a DOM dash repeat element. It expects a template inside of it, and it works that way. This is a general pattern that's going to basically work. Again, it's not super pretty, but it's what you can do. Great. Thanks. Let's go again. Hi. Uh, thank you for this. This event. It was great. Um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> actually, you need to bring them back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why not? <laughs> uh, that's a just uh, on the Polymer project website. There's still a mention about an upgrade tools to two zero from one X. Any update on this? On the upgrade tools? Yeah, oh, the upgrade there tool. was a mention about <laughs> upgrade yeah. tools from one zero to two. Yeah, so you know, last year we said we're we're going to make this upgrade tool, and then uh, this is kind of my bad a little bit. It seemed like most of the feedback was like, oh, it's really easy to upgrade. And the things that were tricky to upgrade were actually going to be impossible for a tool to automate. Things like converting a content uh, tag to a slot tag where the content tag actually had a selector. There's no way we can just automatically determine what the slot name should be everywhere and, and apply it. Um, so it seemed kind of to us for a while that everybody that we were hearing from was kind of satisfied with how easy it was to upgrade. And then it seemed like more recently we heard an uptick in number of people who uh, were asking about, about the tool and wanted it. Um, so also recently we started converting all the internal elements inside Google from one to two. And uh, Peter, an engineer on the tools team, has been working on the tool um, quite recently. It's not a uh, very clean code. We've just been like hacking at it to, to do whatever upgrade we could. And so we're planning on releasing uh, the version that we have for internal, uh, external pretty soon. OK. Then do you have a suggestion to lint old element to find you know, quickly what has to be changed to zero, right? rather than you know, going to each element and you know, searching for specific things, but you know, something to lint so it's highlighted a way to highlight in your code you know, what should be changed. Like, yeah, yeah a, we a can certainly, if there's cases where we, we, we can't determine what it should be, okay. we can output a message that says, you know, this needs to be updated by you. Okay, um, yeah. okay. okay. thanks. Good. All right, we're running long time. Let's do one more live question. Hello. Uh, my question is, do we have any Tutorials or videos for the making something like neon animation because we really love in the love the neon animations in the polymer one. I think the question is about neon animations and its future, right? So is it is yeah is it, if it is we have a blog post that Elliot wrote you probably saw him on stage before um, on the Polymer Summit site that kind of explains what happened to neon anim animations and what's going to happen to neon but, animations. Yeah. So. And, my question is like, uh, is there any some new videos or tutorials like Neon Animation? Because in the version two, it is deprecated, right? Uh, will there be repl replacements for Neon Animation? Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah. I don't think so. The problem with Neon Animation is that it's fundamentally a flawed concept that we thought was going to work and doesn't. Like, it doesn't actually add anything in the current state that it is amazing to the Web Animations Polyfill uh, API and 
we had a team, the team that actually works on the Web Animations API, look at making a new and better neon animation. And what it ended up being was the Web Animations API. Uh, so it turns out just like a declarative REPL would be amazing, but it just doesn't really work well. And if you want to, it's just a jar of spiders. Yeah, I'll also plug Valdrin, another engineer on the team, <laughs> made a code lab <laughs> for performant <laughs> expand collapse animations. And just by going through that, you can see, you know, something pretty typical that anybody would want to build and how he does it. And then you can learn yourself and maybe apply that to some other projects. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. Let's close out with a question that I love, which is, um, what would each of you see as your number one request or ho current hole in the web platform, a feature or some change that you would like to see made to the web platform to make it better? Uh, there's two. I'll go one and hope somebody else does the other one. Uh, I think right now for web components, we're looking pretty good with uh, native implementations, at least in Chrome and Safari. Uh, the one piece that seems to be left to make everything much better is the theming support uh, in CSS for Shadow DOM. So that's the part and theme uh, CSS spec. It just got promoted to a uh, working draft or editor's draft. Damn it, that was a good one. I want to Oh, you want to take the other one, ahead? No, it's fine. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, that, that yes. would just help. Uh, that would just help everybody uh, theme across their shadow roots. Uh, and yeah, that was mine. <laughs> um, for better or for worse, for some reason, I care about inputs and forms, despite never actually mm -hmm. using a form on anything that I've ever made. Um, so what I would like to see in the web platform is input being less opinionated and forms being less opinionated, native elements being less opinionated about their tag names. So form caring about more than just input and you know, input type equals color actually working on all of the browsers because it's not yet. <laughs> yeah, form and input. I would like form and input to succeed at their job. Yeah, so mine, it's kind of related to that. Like, there's a lot of things that native elements can do. There's like a lot of built in magic. Um, I've been working on accessibility a lot. The how to components that uh, we all worked on, um, accessibility was like the primary driver behind that work. We were like, how do we build tabs and trees as custom elements and make sure they are like really like robust and accessible, right? Fully keyboard accessible, doing all the right things with ARIA, everything we can possibly try. And then I, there's still places where we come up short because there's some stuff that we just can't do in the browser today, the, the label element and things like that. You click on a label and it focuses your control. That's a cool magical behavior that like just there's no easy way to get that. You're going to have to make your own custom element label now. And then you end up just reinventing like all of HTML to get all these little features. So I'm really excited about AOM and other, you know, other stuff like uh, being able to hook into forms. I think these are probably some of the most common things folks have brought up, and we've, we've kind of been pushing for them for years. Um, I actually think people are listening a little bit more right Definitely now. Definitely about forms. I think forms yeah. are actually a good, yeah. I think good we're, hope. I think we're like finally getting through to some folks there. Um, so yeah, that's really what I want. I want, I want to make sure the future of HTML is, is accessible and, and that it's easy for developers to do that, to do the right things. And it's not like this arcane art to make something accessible. Cool. Uh, I think that the biggest frustration I have is when there's like a really cool feature, uh, and not every browser has it, of course. So, you know, trying to bring down polyfills, and I think a way that that could happen is oddly enough through payments and commerce on the web, because the more we allow users to buy things and spend money there, the more companies pay attention. Large companies that have tons and tons of sites and have tons and tons of tons of developers, and so if we can start doing more stuff uh, with payments. I know that. Uh, Chrome payments just came to desktop. We'll start attracting a lot more attention, and then hopefully companies will start putting a lot more attention into their uh, browsers or paying attention in, in standards meetings and stuff. Um, yeah, people on the team know that the thing I care about sort of the most is performance. And I think I've said this before, but you know, I think with custom elements, we have an opportunity to add things to the browser that makes it faster, makes us able to do things custom, in custom ways faster. Um, I care about this for a couple reasons. Obviously, I want things to be faster so that we can all make stuff that's awesome and better for users. But there's another reason. And um, you heard yesterday in Alex Russell's talk, he talked a lot about mobile CPUs. Now, he only talked about that for like five minutes. But he works in the same office as us. 
And we have to hear him talk about that for like hours and hours and hours and hours. And I would like to have things faster so I don't have to hear that venting very much anymore. <laughs> Alex, he's joking. We love you. Please yeah. talk to us. All right, great. So Matt's going to come on in a second with some closing remarks and some very important announcements. So please be sure to stick around. Uh, but thank you so much for the panel. Thank you. And thank you.